Okay, well, it doesn't look like anybody's coming in right now. So um, welcome to the second session of our study group. Um, I hope everybody has had a reasonably good three weeks. Um, my memory for names is poor, but I think two of you were not at the first session. So if you were not at the first session, could you introduce yourself? Um, I believe Tris was not, and Sam Grund was not. Tris? Um, I was at the first session, but I'm a philosophy of science student at the University of Utah. Oh, uh, all right. Well, as I say, my um, memory for names is terrible. Uh, what about? Um, hmm. Well, it looks like Sam must have had technical difficulties because he just disappeared. Anyway, nope. all right. So nobody else, uh, everybody, uh, it looks like, was at the first session. Um, it looks like quite a few people didn't, are not here that were at the first session, but they might be coming back. Oh, um, Philip. Okay, Philip, uh, you were not. Why don't you introduce yourself then? and say just a little bit about your uh, scientific background or lack of science. You need to unmute yourself. Am I unmuted now? Yes. Okay, I'm. my vocation is an artist and my profession is a, an accountant and uh, finance uh, background. Okay, and where are you located, Philip? In uh, New Mexico. Okay, right. Um, okay, well, look, then let's just get started. Uh, before we go into the new readings concerning Maxwell, I want to impart something that uh, is relevant to our last class. But I found, I learned subsequently. So I was reading one of the magazines I subscribed to, which is Physics Today. And they had an interesting historical article on uh, a scientist named John Herschel. Now, many of you probably have not heard of John Herschel. I actually didn't. but. You probably, you may have heard of his father, William Herschel, William Herschel's biggest claim to fame, although he did many important scientific discoveries, is that he was the uh, discoverer of the planet uh, Uranus. So uh, we just got somebody back in, okay. Um, And uh, his son followed in his father's footsteps uh, and was a leading scientist and astronomer. But the most interesting thing from our standpoint was that he was an author in 1831 of a very widely read popularization of about science and the scientific method. Because as I mentioned, although Faraday was an exemplar of the scientific method, as far as I could see, he didn't write much about the method itself. But in this very influential book, which was Principles of Natural Philosophy, um, Herschel, John Herschel spent a lot of time laying out the scientific method. And in fact, he was a big influence on Faraday and other scientists who explicitly said that they, they had um, were influenced by his uh, 
description of the scientific method. I'll be sending this to you so you'll have it for reference, but let me just take the time to read a, a core summary of what he emphasizes uh, in the section on scientific method. But a law of nature has not that degree of generality which fits it into a stepping stone to greater inductions unless it be universal emphasized in its application. We cannot rely on its enabling us to extend our views beyond the circumstances of instances from which it was obtained. In other words, the experiments that led to the hypothesis of a law of nature, unless we have already experienced its power to do so, unless it has actually enabled us before trial to say what will take place in cases analogous to those originally contemplated. Unless in short, we have studiously placed ourselves in the situation of its antagonists and perversely endeavored to find exceptions to it without success. It's in the precise proportion that a law once obtained endures this extreme severity of trial that its value and importance are to be estimated. And our next step in verification must therefore consist in extending its application to cases not originally contemplated, in studiously varying the circumstances under which our causes act with a view to a certain whether their effect is general and pushing the application of our laws to extreme cases. So again, this is the key emphasis that I made in the earlier session that for a scientific concept to be verified, it has to predict experiments, observations that have not yet been performed. In the verification of a law whose expression is quantitative, not only must its generality be established by the trial in various circumstances, but every such trial must be one of precise measurement. And in such cases, the means for subjecting it to trial ought to be so devised as to repeat and multiply a great number of times any deviation, if any exists, so that if it ever be so small, it shall at last become sensible. So again, the idea that scientific discoveries that we can trust must be verified by multiple predictions and they must be quantitatively accurate. And as we'll get to as we move into the 20th, 20th century and the 21st century of physics, this is one of the core principles that has become abandoned in the study of cosmology um, and has led to really big errors being committed in not accepting this core basis of the scientific method, which, as I said, in the 19th century had a huge influence on scientists such as Faraday. Uh, okay. Okay, so let me just stop and say any questions about this this new material before we go on to Maxwell comments. Okay, so I hope people did the readings. Uh, so I'm going to again start with questions. What can people tell each other about what were the key advances that Maxwell accomplished beyond where electromagnetism had been left by Faraday? Anyone want to jump in? Yeah. 
come, come. Do I have to call on people? Oh, great. Alex. Uh, so one of the main things he came up with, I believe, was the concept that the uh, there's a, a field uh, of an area of space that is the area with which uh, an object with a charge or a magnetic field has influence on another charged particle, that the effect wasn't necessarily a particle to particle direct connection, but it was a, a field effect. Well, but Faraday already had invented the concept of the field. In other words, certainly with the magnetic field, he emphasized that by 1850, he was writing that the field, which he described as the uh, the region of space that is described by the magnetic lines of force, that that was a real thing, that the magnetic lines of force, and particularly the magnetic direction, was not something that was just used to calculate, but was really an objective aspect. But Maxwell really went beyond that in certain ways. So, uh, Ron, you want to jump in? Yeah, I think what Maxwell did was he gave the theories a strong um, analytical basis. So he developed the uh, mathematical descriptions behind what the observations were telling him. And then he also then related those um, mathematical descriptions to the actual data that was known about various uh, phenomena in electromagnetism at the time. Well, what were some of the main concepts that were embodied in those mathematical equations? We'll get to the, the mathematical equations, Maxwell's laws in a second. Um, okay, Peter. Peter, you're muted. I don't, am I muted? You're now unmuted. We can hear oh, you. Yeah. Okay. So I was quite, <clears throat> when I read, because <clears throat> I, sorry, <clears throat> I did read um, the articles. I was quite fascinated to see that he, I think, even for, treating electrical fields in the first instance, he ended up with something like 20 equations, didn't he? Um, I don't know how we, how, what I was interested in was how we got from what, because he, he developed he's loads and loads of different of, of equations. How we okay, got from, you, know, you sort of are, equations. okay. Peter, I'm sorry, you are breaking up a little. I'm more or less following you, um, but you, your system is dropping a few words. Could you just repeat and let's, let's see whether it was better? Yeah, well, he, he developed, we ended up with the four, the four equations. I'm not sure whether he ended up with four equations himself, but the concept of um, the uh, rotation of, magnet, of a magnetic field in response to an electric current was in one equation. The concept that there was no, uh, that you couldn't have a single magnetic pole was in another equation, etc. So, and as you said, he formulated the, cal the calculus which um, described those. One thing that I was unclear about very unsure about was he still seemed to believe in the luminiferous ether as the transport mechanism for all this. 
Now you're on mute, I think. Um, okay, Peter, you better mute yourself because I think you have a source of static in the background. Right, thank you. Um, right, well, first of all, this wasn't in the readings um, and Peter's quite correct. The initial set of Maxwell's equations were actually 20 equations. And therefore they couldn't fit on a T-shirt unless you printed them very small. Um, so it was actually heavy side. Um, 20 years later in the 1880s, who mathematically reduced these 20 equations to the familiar equations that we know of and that um, I did, uh, you know, write down individually on the website. So these, strictly speaking, are heavy side equations, but we really correctly call them Maxwell equations because the scientific con content of the equations was developed by Maxwell. Let me just, just throw out one of the, the most significant things that you know, Maxwell did beyond Faraday, although Faraday was completely trending in this direction, is that he demonstrated that electricity and magnetism were aspects of a single physical phenomenon, electromagnetism. His ability to write these set of initially 20 equations describing pretty much the totality of what was then known about the behavior of electricity and magnetism. That was the demonstration that electromagnetism was a single phenomenon and could be described in a single set of equations. Uh, any other things that were new and original about these equations that people noted from the readings? Yes, Chris. Oh. Uh, no, I mean Sam, sorry. <laughs> um, he predicted electromagnetic waves um, for the first time, which ended up being instrumental to the development of a lot of technology thereafter. Like Right, right. This was, and what did he, what did he, hypothesized was one example of electromagnetic waves. Light. Right. So this was this was a, a huge double discovery, right? On the one hand, Maxwell said that his equations indicated that since changing magnetic fields create changing electric fields, and changing electric fields create changing magnetic fields in free space, that this must lead to electromagnetic waves. And then he made this another enormous leap, which was based on recent discoveries, which was the, the recent measurement of the electrostatic set of units and the electromagnetic set of units ended up that these two units could be related observationally by a constant which had the dimensions of velocity and had the um, magnitude that was known by the most recent measurements. People have been measuring the speed of light for decades and improving these measurements that it was known to be the same as the speed of light. So Maxwell's tremendous leap was to take what appeared to be merely a coincidence and say that this was actually inherent in the nature of light. So now in this revolutionary paper that, and a series of papers that he started publishing in 1865, he not only said that there was this new phenomenon, which he predicted, which had not actually been observed, which was electromagnetic 
ways. And he said, well, we really have observed them because this is the phenomena of life. And this completed the overthrow of the original Newtonian idea that light could be described as particles, which people experimentally had been already uh, poking holes in because of the phenomena of interference of light, which we'll again get into later in this series, demonstrating the wave nature of light. So, right, so that's two huge steps that were taken with this, which was wave, electromagnetic waves are possible in free space, in vacuum. And secondly, this uh, corresponded to the phenomenon we know of as light. Now, getting back to uh, Alex's question, it was Maxwell's hypothesis that this was, these fields existed where there was no other matter. Now, it was very uncomfortable for people at that day to simply say, well, these were the fields. The fields is what was existing in the vacuum. So they basically said, well, what was vibrating? And what was vibrating was a fluid they hypothesized, which was the luminiferous ether. Now, how they came up with the, the ether uh, term, I'm not quite sure. That might have been an ancient term. Part of the motivation for this is that people rapidly discovered that there was a big, not complete, but big overlap between the mathematical laws embodied in Maxwell's equations and the laws that were being discovered for fluid mechanics, for fluid behavior. And we'll get into that as as soon as we, just in just a few minutes in, in more detail. So there was the hypothesis that there was a material that was oscillating, giving rise to these fields. That wasn't actually, people found out later, necessary to understanding these fields. They could be understood, just that the fields were the object that was varying. Any other big advances conceptually that were based on these uh, Maxwell's equations? Anybody else? Yeah. Conservation of energy. Um, well, it wasn't so much conservation of energy, but it was what about energy in these fields? I mean, it was basically that there were two things contained about energy. One is this was sort of implied, but not actually discovered by Faraday, that the magnetic field contained energy, that both the magnetic field and the electric field contained energy. And he de developed the equations for that, that the um, energy density of the field was proportional to the square of the strength of the field. So, Energy density, for example, in the CGS system, uh, the energy density of a magnetic field is just B squared over eight pi. Um, so that was extremely important. And the other thing was, and this had enormous technological implications that only played out over 
decades of the rest of the decades of the 19th century was that magnetic fields could convey energy. Now this was obvious once you say, well, light is electromagnetic fields because people already knew that light could convey energy. But this was a fundamental discovery that changing electric and magnetic fields could convey energy from one place to another and could convey it as rapidly at various speeds, depending on the material, but in vacuum could convey it at the speed of light. So why don't we just go on and look at the actual meaning of these equations? So why don't we go through them one by one? Let's start with, well, two by two. Let's start with the first two because they are sort of in pairs. Um, let me see. Uh, I was going to pull them up on the screen. Um, Uh, so let me see whether I can share screen here. Nope, wrong direction. Sorry, let's see. There we go. Okay. Everybody can see that, right? Yes. Okay. So who wants to say what's, what is basically your understanding of these first two equations? What do they basically mean physically? Anyone want to jump in? I mean, I've written them in English, so we don't have to worry about uh, Greek, uh, Latin, yeah, Greek symbols. But what does this convey physically? Uh, all right, let me call on somebody. Annette, you want to answer that? So um, basically the electric field flows out from an object in proportion to its charge. Um, And magnetic field, there's no net flow outward of the magnetic field because it goes out one pole and comes in the other one. Right. There are no magnetic charges. And that's that's a very that's basically the entirety of the asymmetry between the magnetic and electric fields. Um and obviously an extremely important one, um, that there are no electric charges 
there are no magnetic charges and there are electric charges. And obviously, the first one is basically Coulomb's law. So by describing this mathematically as the divergence, so that uh, Greek symbol uh, is pronounced as del or divergence, we immediately derive, we immediately can mathematically derive a one over r squared law of the electric field, static electric field. So does anyone want to, thanks Annette, so does anyone want to take the second two, which are the dynamical, electrodynamic part of Maxwell's equations, as opposed to the electrostatic part? What is the, is the physical concepts conveyed here? Uh, ben, you want to take a crack at it? Ben Lewis? Okay. Tris, you want to? Um. Yeah, I mean, I'll take a crack at it. It says that the... Uh electric and magnetic fields um, are proportional and opposite to each other? Is that describing like their orth orth orthogonality, like they're being at right angles to each other? Well, okay. Remember that the, the, in the third equation, what traditionally has been called a third equation, this side is about a rate of change. So again, these symbols um, are the partial rate of change of B with respect to time. So of course, B can vary in space and does vary in space, but this is the amount that the B field, the magnetic field varies at a given point with respect to time. So it's a rate of change, right? So what does that rate of change then apply imply about the electric field? You want to try and go on, Tris? I guess you said it's in the opposite direction, but that it's like um, proportional in magnitude. It's proportional in magnitude in opposite direction. But what does this symbol basically mean? And this is pronounced uh, del cross or just curl of E. This is where it gets a little complicated. What are we talking about here? Anybody? Rotation. Okay, somebody's raised their hands and I don't see them. Okay, uh, Ron. Uh, is your hand actually up or did you just leave it up? Okay, unmuted now. <laughs> yeah. that, that's the cross product term between two vectors. So what we're looking at there is uh, you'll get the a magnitude and a direction between those two vectors, the curl vector and the electric field. Uh, it, it'll tell you the direction and the magnitude of them once you've uh, applied that vector operator on the two vectors. That right. Helps? But physically... What does the curl mean, Peter? Again, I, I don't know whether your hand is up or you just left it up. Yeah, yeah, it's up. Okay. 
um, it's a rotation. So ah. a changing magnetic field in a given direction causes a rotating magnetic field around it. Right, right. And that's, that's what's very different between the electromagnetic field and the, the gravitational field. The gravitational field acts straight lines, but the electromagnetic field have this twist. So the term curl is actually a very descriptive. Most, most physical terms are not actually well chosen, but curl is well chosen because it has the idea of something curling around. So as I say in the English translation, the rate of rotation and direction of the rotation axis of the electric field is proportional to and in opposite direction of the rate of change in the magnetic field. So what do we mean by the rotation of the electric field? And this is where we get into the very useful hydrodynamic or fluid dynamic analogy to electrodynamics. Because if you want to understand what this mathematical operation, the curl, means, let's take fluid flow. So we have any fluid flowing in the sink, in the river, anywhere. And we make a mathematical description of that fluid flow by labeling its velocity. It, it is a field of velocity vectors. You imagine that every point, this fluid flow is described by an arrow moving in the direction of the fluid at that point and whose length is proportional to the velocity of the flow. So if you take an actual flowing fluid and you say, how fast is it spinning around at any point? And in what direction is it spinning? Then you get the curve. So again, I, I actually tried to make a video of this, but I was totally unsuccessful. It's, it really takes more skill than I have. But if you imagine taking a little ball, like a uh, ping pong ball, and putting some marking on it so you can see what direction it's spinning in. And you put this ball in a, a uh, turbulent fluid flow. At any point that the ball is, you see what direction the ball is spinning in, the direction of its spin axis. That's the direction of the curl vector. And how fast it's spinning, that's the amplitude of the curl effect. So that's pretty easy to imagine for a fluid velocity vector field. Well, if you simply substitute in these equations the electric field vectors, or in the fourth equation, the magnetic field vectors, and again, these are just arrows at every point in space whose direction is the direction of the field and whose length is the amplitude of the field. And you imagine them as a fluid, then you get this quantity of the curve. Now, as you can imagine, I don't know whether it's easy to imagine or not, but this relationship makes Maxwell's equations in the general case very difficult to solve mathematically. In special cases, they can be solved, and I'll get to that in a, in a second. But in the general case, it's very difficult, even with high speed computers, to solve these equations because you're basically saying, we know the curl, we have to figure out the actual field that will produce that curl. A way of, of looking at these equations is 
that I find useful. I don't know whether people were familiar with this toy in their childhood. But there's a, a spin toy where you simply press the top of the, the toy and it starts spinning, the form of top. And of course, it, it does that because there's a screw mechanism inside that you're physically activated. Well, that actually is a picture of these equations, is that if you imagine the rate of change in the rate you're pushing down on this top, the rate of change of the B field, and the resulting spin, the curve, is what happens with the electric field. And vice versa, in the fourth equation, if you take this second uh, term in the equation, that's what you have for the magnetic field. So that's symmetrical. But obviously, there's one big difference, which is goes back to the fact that we have electric charges. That the magnetic field is also created by moving electric charges. So J is the current density, the amount of density of moving charges. Now this time Maxwell did not know what these charges were. They just knew that there was a flow of charge and that flow could be directly related to the curl of the so that's the, the basic physical notion. And of course, from if you set current to zero, as it is in a vacuum, where there are no charges, we're abstracting from the reality. There are always charges in physical space, but we're abstracting to a true vacuum. Then you put these two equations together and in that case, you can solve it. And the solution is an electromagnetic wave. And what the amplitude and frequency of that wave is, is only determined by the initial conditions you put into solving the equation. So the equations show that everywhere there will be electromagnetic waves and to find out what is actually waving and how fast you have to solve these equations with certain initial conditions. So let's stop there um, and questions, comments. Anybody? All right, so I'm gonna, well, everybody is totally clear on, on Maxwell's equations. Next time we'll, we'll, we'll uh, have some of you give a full explanation of it. So uh, be ready. Okay, so This goes a little beyond, this goes to people's general knowledge, but this goes a little beyond what the readings are. But we, um, some of the readings discuss this. What, to your knowledge, were some of the technological developments that flowed from these concepts of Maxwell's equation? Does anyone want to? put forward something. Ah, so Philip already has said radio, right. Do you want to elaborate on that? Philip? No. Uh, does anyone want to elaborate on? People know the history of, of radio. Probably we should get into a little of these in the next session. But what happened is, of course, 
after these equations became known, even in their initial sense, people realized that light waves were only characterized by a certain narrow range of frequency. The light that we can see with our eyes is essentially the equivalent of a musical octave. The lowest frequency of light, which is deep red, is approximately, is very close to half the frequency of the highest frequency our eyes can see, which comes through as violet. The people fairly rapidly realized that there must be a lot of other electromagnetic waves. And particularly, they got interested in the idea that there would be waves that were much slower. And essentially what happened was that as with the rapid development of electromagnetic technology in the three decades after uh, these equations became known, people started to experiment with detect, trying to detect these electromagnetic waves. And um, the first time this happened successfully, uh, I lost my cheat sheet. I don't remember these dates myself, so that's why I have the, the uh, shape. So uh, it was in 1994, so 30 years later, that Marconi was able to actually develop the first practical radio. And that was based on the earlier work of Heinrich Hertz, which was in 1888. So what Hertz did was he was able to develop very strong electromagnetic wave by using a spark gap. Now, those of you who might follow our research in fusion might be familiar with the term spark gap because this is physical basis for our very fast switches. A spark gap is exactly what it sounds like is you have a very high electric field across an air or gas gap. And as you raise the electric field, you can get to the point where the air breaks down and a spark of electricity flows. This happens very rapidly and therefore creates a big change in current and therefore what a big change in the magnetic field so you create a very strong magnetic electromagnetic wave well what hertz did was that he did an experiment in which he put a spark gap over here in which he was running a very large amount of current and he had a much smaller spark gap over here with a coil attached to it. it, was a coil from Maxwell's equation. You could figure out the current produced by an electromagnetic wave on a coil. And the coil would produce a big electric potential. So that would cause a spark in the smaller spark gap on the other side of his laboratory. And that's exactly what he observed. He observed that he was able to send these electromagnetic waves. And the spark gap was actually the first form radio transmitted. So that when um, six years later, Marconi developed the first practical wireless telegraph, the radio, he was using 
a repetitive spark gap to stand in telegraph signals remotely. So obviously, you can't have the, the whole notion of radio waves without Maxwell's discovery that electromagnetic waves exist. Um, you know, let me just throw out a few other things on this list is that, again, people weren't using in general. They were not solving Maxwell's equations in the general case, except for electromagnetic waves. They were solving them in specific cases that could be simplified. For example, the coil, the, um, the solenoid as it's called, that would be a very simple form in which you have current flowing through the coil. You could solve the electromagnetic Maxwell's equation for that coil. You could solve it for a single wire. There were many special cases that you could solve it for. And people, inventors, engineers, other scientists use those special cases to understand the design of much more complex pieces of equipment. So, uh, one of the most important piece of equipment that was designed on the basis, not of Maxwell's laws directly, but the concepts behind it was efficient dynamos. So dynamos are turning mechanical energy into electrical energy. So you have in 1878, only 13 years after Maxwell's discoveries were announced, the first practical hydroelectric generation system. You have uh, in 79, Edison, who had invented the incandescent light bulb, also invented the first practical system of dynamos and electric distribution, which was on the basis of DC. But again, those efficient dynamos were only developed on the basis of Maxwell's discoveries. So you have by 1882, the first actual mass application simultaneously in London and New York of electricity distribution uh, for incandescent lighting. And then the other thing that was actually news to me was even though the notion of an electric motor, the contrary transformation of uh, electricity into mechanical motion was discovered back in the early decades of the 19th century by Faraday, who showed that, that you can create motion with an electric field moving through a magnetic field. A practical electric motor was not developed until the 1880s. So you have practical electric motors that are sufficiently high efficiency and can handle uh, different loads being developed in the 1880s, again, during this period of very rapid development after Maxwell's equations made these uh, inventions practical. So um, yeah, this is again in the middle of the 1880s. Uh, And the other important development was how do we use electromagnetic waves in our technology today other than sending electromagnetic waves in various frequencies uh, through free space? What's the other application of an altering electric field and magnetic field? Uh, Sam. Uh, 
Gosh. Altering electric and magnetic field. Come on. Altering electric and magnetic field. Uh, Can I get a hint? All right, big hint. Why did um, Elon Musk name his company Tesla? Because of the scientist? Right. And why was the scientist really important for electric technology? What was this? I mean, he made many contributions, but what was the biggest contribution Tesla made to electric technology that we're using right now on this uh, Zoom, which is basically, I think, not trans. Well, I guess it is transmitted over optical fiber, and, but uh, for the most part, it's not transmitted. Yeah. Uh, this is not transmitted through free space, except for your Wi-Fi, the last few feet are through free space. How is this signal being trans, our signal to each other being transmitted? So is, uh, is it alternating electric? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> not only is it being transmitted, all of the gadgets around us are being powered by alternating current. So remember, alternating current, in DC, it's very intuitive. Okay, the electrons are traveling from here to there, and they're carrying the energy with them. But in AC, the electrons are going, whoops, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, 60 cycles a second here, if any of you were, I don't think any of you are, any of you are in Europe, it's 50 cycles a second. The energy is coming from the electric generating plants to our computers, our lights, our heating system, all of that, because they're being carried by an electromagnetic wave in conductors. So this electromagnetic wave is care of changing electric and magnetic field is carrying that energy directionally from the source to the low. It was Tesla who developed a practical system, which we'll probably go into in the next session, uh, of conveying this power in an alternating current. And it turned out that it had enormous practical advantages over DC. And even though there was a huge battle between Edison on the one hand and Tesla and his financier backer Westinghouse on the other, in the end, there it, AC transmission is enormously cheaper. And today we use DC transmission only for very limited uh, situations uh, where it is practical to transmit DC power at extremely high voltages. And the Chinese have, believe it or not, DC power lines that are uh, energized to one megavolt. Uh, and they transmit that over long distances. But in general, it's much more practical to use AC. So all of our technology, the highly efficient motors that we use, highly efficient dynamos, all of this is based on Tesla's AC technology, alternating current. And that in turn, you would never have gotten the idea without the 20 years earlier scientific discovery that electromagnetic waves and transfer energy. And they can transfer energy both in free space and using electric conductors. And these electric, the 
you know, wire, the uh, current is flowing through the wire, but the electromagnetic field around the wire is what's actually conveying the energy. And we can see that more dramatically when we get to higher frequencies, like microwave frequencies, which are the design, just a designation of the highest frequency radio waves, are conveyed in what we call waveguides. These waveguides actually exist in miniature, even in uh, microelectronics. So a waveguide is a hollow tube, normally rectangular tube, of conducting material, and the power is delivered within that waveguide in the empty space or insulated space within. So that basic notion of energy could be conveyed by electromagnetic waves by alternating electric and magnetic fields. That's essentially the basis of the entire underlying structure of the transition from steam power to electrified uh, technology that was happening very rapidly during the last 30 years of the 19th century. So by the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, even though most of the world wasn't electrified, most of the United States even wasn't electrified, in the large industrialized cities where the technology was fully realized, you basically had the whole basis for the transition that motive power was delivered by electricity and dynamos and electric motors were the basis of beginning to be the basis of industry. So um, okay. So let me break here again and just questions and general discussion on what we've covered so far. Okay, Philip had the question, telegraph. Um, somebody's complaining that nobody's reading the chat. Um, all right, I'll go back and read the chat. Um, Okay, Martin had a few questions. The orthogonality of the waves and the direction of motion. Right, so that's correct. The, the waves that Maxwell discovered, that he hypothesized from his equations and said were the waves of light, these are what's called transverse waves. So the electric field and the magnetic field, whatever direction they have, that direction is always in the plane perpendicular to the direction that the wave is moving. And the electric field and the magnetic field are oscillating orthogonally to each other. So you can have any orientation of these two fields relative to vertical. And that's called the polarization direction of the wave. So the direction that the electric field is oscillating in is called the polarization direction. And we know from Polaroid glasses that there are materials that will only pass polarized light in a single direction or will heavily suppress uh, light that's polarized in other directions. But in all cases, whatever the direction of the electromagnetic electric field is oscillating, that perpendicular both to the direction the magnetic field is oscillating and to the direction that the uh, wave is moving. <clears throat> 
So, uh, is curl measured in radians per unit time? Uh, well, the curl is what we call an operator. So the curl is what you do to the electric field, which again is this field of vectors mathematically described, or the magnetic field to produce the curl vector. So the units of the curl vector is related to the units of the field. So the uh, when you take the curl of the electric field, you get a vector whose units are magnetic field units. If you're applying the curl to the magnetic field, you get a curl that's whose units are the electric field strength. Magnetic field strength is the curl of the electric um, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry. The all right, start over. The curl of the electric field is in units of magnetic field rate of change. So it would be Gauss per second if we're dealing with CGS. By the way, I, I, I haven't mentioned to people, one thing that's a little confusing about physics is physics uses two separate um, units, systems of units interchangeably. One is called CGS, centimeter, gram, second, and the other is called standard international SI, which is kilogram, meters, seconds. So sometimes the names of these units and of course their magnitudes change. So that's why I say sometimes CGS, sometimes SI. So the magnetic field strength unit CGS is Gauss. For example, the magnetic field of the earth has a value of approximately one third of a Gauss. It's a pretty weak field. So if you take the curl of the electric field, you'll get something that has the units Gauss per second. So it's the rate of change, the magnetic field. If you take the curl of the magnetic field, you'll get something that has the units um, and the more familiar units in, in electrical are SI units, volts per meter per second. So again, it's the rate of change of the electric field. So that's the units that you get from the curl. Um, and then Peter asked, was the telegraph one of those inventions? No, the telegraph had already been developed on the basis of Ampere and Faraday's experiments. Once people knew from Faraday's experiments that a, you could send a current through a wire and that the changing current in the wire could induce a changing current in an inductor, in a coil, then you could send signals over a wire. So the first practical telegraph is invented by Morse, and of course, we know Morse code, in 1844. So this is 20 years before Maxwell. And that was the first mass use of electric technology. And of course, it was a revolutionary use because, as I mentioned previously, you went in the period from the 40s uh, into the 50s and 60s of the 19th century, from a period that communications were limited to the speed of a horse 
for the speed of a ship, very, very slow. Essentially, communications did not sped up by the early 19th century compared with, you know, ancient times uh, to having the modern experience starting in the 1840s of having essentially instantaneous communication. Initially, over continental distances, it wasn't until much later in the century, in the second half, that you had the transcontinental uh, uh, cables under the sea connecting Europe to the United States. So this was really a revolutionary change, first big revolutionary change in communications technology. So by the time, for example, of our own uh, civil war, you know, Lincoln was routinely communicating with his generals, not by horseback, but by telegraph. So that was something that did not require Maxwell's equations, but just required uh, the, uh, the Faraday equations and the discoveries of Michael Faraday. Now, what's interesting, by the way, is that this technology enabled scientific discoveries just by its existence. So uh, people may be aware of the concern about the vulnerability of our present electric grid to very large solar storms. So solar storms are energy plasma energy that's emitted by the sun that can affect the electric mag uh, the magnetic field of the earth and through Maxwell's laws can induce strong currents in large electric and uh, long electric wires such as the wires of our grid. So in 1859, when the only grid that existed was the telegraph network, there was a very large solar storm called the Carrington event. And people, for the first time, observed the effect of the, electro uh, the, the solar storms because the uh, telegraph wires started generating huge amounts of electric current. So the telegraph op operators started getting shocks from their equipment. And they found out that even if they turned off the power supply for the telegraph, the telegraph was still working because the solar storm was supplying power to the electric telegraph lines. So this was something that was observed as sort of curious and maybe a minor inconvenience. If the same event occurred today without warning, which I think is probably impossible with our present satellite network, it would essentially do hundreds of billions of dollars worth of damage to the electric grid. It would have an extremely serious effect on our economy. So as I say, you basically have the early period pre-Maxwell uh, in which the telegraph is the main electrical phenomenon and electrical technology. And you don't have practical dynamos, you don't have practical uh, motors, even though people knew that these were theoretically possible. And then in the second part of the, the, the final third of the 19th century, we have this huge development in which you transition basically from the era of steam and horses to an entirely electric, a mainly electric based technology. So, okay. So further questions on, on this section or comments? <laughs> 
I have a question. It might be a sort of uh, naive, but uh, just to go back to like the basic question of like, like a changing electric field produces a changing magnetic field, right? Right. And then a changing magnetic field produces a changing electric field. So where does that relationship like stop? Like where does it close? Why? Where does it close? Like if an electric field generates a magnetic field and then that generates an electric field and then that generates an electric field. Well, it doesn't. In other words, essentially you have for an electromagnetic wave to dissipate, you have to have some energy uh, damping. So if you don't have this damping, it goes on forever. I mean, on a dark night, if you can get to a dark sky, which are less and less available, I mean, what are you seeing? You're seeing light electromagnetic waves that have been traveling for billions of years. The JWST telescope, we can we can and do debate in cos cosmology what distances we're looking at, but there's no de debate. These distances are more than billions of light years. And that, by definition of a light year, the distance that light travels in a year, means that the light that JWST has been observing has been fluctuating back and forth, back and forth, electricity and electric and magnetic field for billions of years as it travels through space because there is not enough matter to damp these waves. Now, if you look in the opposite direction, uh, the funny thing is we can see more and know more about what is above us billions of light years than what's at the bottom of the ocean as this futile search for the uh, Titan proved. You can't see through the ocean. Um, so electric, electromagnetic waves are rapidly damped as they move through the ocean. Why? Because the ocean is a conductor. The ocean is not pure water, of course. It's salt water. Salt water is a, because the sodium and uh, chlorine ions have come apart in water, there are electrons that can travel freely through the water, not as freely as through a wire, but quite freely. So of course, as we all know from our safety lessons, water conducts electricity. If you're in a hurricane, you can be electrocuted by downed wires uh, through a puddle. But if you try to send electromagnetic waves, of essentially any frequency, through seawater, they induce currents in the seawater. And since seawater is not a perfect conductor, that current encounters resistance. So more and more of that energy is converted into heat. So if you try and send a, a radio signal through water, you're eventually slightly, very, very slightly heating up the ocean. The same thing, of course, in copper wires. So in our big machine, uh, big in terms of power, not in size, FF to B, we have to be aware that when we send this pulse through the machine, the machine has a resistance of approximately uh, five milliohms, five thousandths of an ohm. So we can calculate what fraction of the energy is going to be 
dissipated its heat and is not going to go into producing fusion reactions. So that's what happens to an electromagnetic wave in a resistive medium. The wave eventually dissipates through the resistance of the medium into heat. But that's not a necessary thing. As I say, you have to have the resistive medium. In space, there is so little matter. Even though the matter is a plasma, is conducting, the conductivity is so high, given the vast amounts of space involved, and given the extremely low densities, that these electromagnetic waves essentially can travel indefinitely. I mean, we are not seeing any, and we don't expect to see any significant opacity in space, even at the distances that JWST. The only opacity that we see in space is due to not the plasma, but to dust particles, essentially soot. So carbon is produced in the development of stars and through supernova and other star formation uh, processes is emitted to the interstellar medium and carbon in space, just like carbon here, tends to form smoke soot. And that soot is slightly opaque. So we, we do see a slight absorption of these of, of a small amount of the radiation. But for the most part, uh, radiation can travel indefinitely through space. Sorry, a long answer to a short question. So other questions? Okay. I have a question. Can yeah. you hear me? Yes, Malcolm. Um, so what you're saying is that there always must be some matter, no matter how little. Is that correct? A field like this cannot exist in the absence of matter. No. No. Well, we'll we'll get into the ether theory in the next uh, in one of the next sessions. That's what Maxwell thought. Maxwell basically thought there must be some sort of matter that supports these oscillations. But the equations don't, the actual mathematical theory that he developed did not dictate that hypothesis. The hypothesis basically said these magnetic fields are real and that they can exist in a vacuum. What I was saying about outer space is we know observationally that in space there is small amounts of plasma, small densities of plasma, but the densities are so small that they don't have practical effect on these electromagnetic waves. What's necessary, what matter is necessary for is for the electromagnetic waves to dissipate. In other words, to stop traveling you need some way of dissipating that energy. And if you have enough matter, the resistance, the electrical resistivity of the matter provides a way for that energy to dissipate. And my example was the ocean, that we can't use radar to look for you know, people or remains at the bottom of the ocean because radar doesn't penetrate, it penetrates uh, you know, a few meters into the ocean. Light penetrates, you know, 30 meters into the ocean. There's really nothing that penetrates deeply into the ocean um, in terms of electromagnetic waves because you're traveling through a conductive medium, but the resistance of that conductive medium dissipates the waves. So the sequence is electromagnetic waves induce 
electric currents, moving electric charges, oscillating in the water or other conductor. And since these charges uh, have encounter resistance, basically collisions that deprive them of their kinetic energy, that rapidly dissipates the energy in the wave. If you don't have that, the wave is perfectly happy and sim can simply continue indefinitely. So does this relate to the zero in the equation, the four equations that we were looking at? Uh, no, not really. Uh, it relates to the fact that that there are no dissipative, mathematically, there are no dissipative terms. In other words, um, mathematically dissipative terms are expressed in terms of imaginary numbers. Now, imaginary numbers are perfectly real. It's just a derogatory name the poor things have been saddled with. Um, but in a real circuit, you would translate Maxwell's equations into circuit equations that contain imaginary terms that are re uh, related to the resistance. And then you would have a decay of the electromagnetic waves. Without those terms, in Maxwell's equations, if you simply assume a vacuum, then those equations have the mathematical form of sine waves. So not only does he determine that, electro, uh, that electromagnetic waves are waves, electromagnetic waves on, in a vacuum have the mathematical form of a sine wave. So that sine wave just continues indefinitely. And yeah, mathematically that just comes from, you know, if you take a sine wave, a mathematics warning, take a sine wave and you differentiate it. So you take the slope of the sine wave, you get, a negative cosine wave. Take the slope of the negative cosine wave, you get a negative sine wave. So because there's a negative, there's one negative sign in the equations, the second derivative of the sine wave gives you back that sine wave. So the changing magnetic field gives rise to changing electric field, changing electric field gives rise to the same changing magnetic field. So that's why a sine wave mathematically becomes the solution of Maxwell's equations. But not a static sine wave, but a sine wave that's in vacuum moving in a given direction with the speed of light. So it's basically from that differential form and the minus sign that you get the electromagnetic waves and you get the lack of energy dissipation. Can you explain what is radioactivity and is radioactive wave under the present understanding of physics, a, uh, a uh, condition that can be rendered um, harmless or, and does this have any bearing on Maxwell's equations or is that beyond the scope of his? Right. We all get, well, I'll answer briefly, but we'll get to that in future sessions. We, I'm more or less going chronologically. So the first few sessions are entirely in the 19th century. 
which is a lot better than the physics you normally get in school, which stops in the 17th century. But we're going to we're going to get to the 20th century. Basically, at in the period we're discussing, which is the last 30 years of the 19th century, scientists knew about electricity. Uh, was, you know, that elect they knew how to get electricity to flow from one place to another, but they did not know what was flowing. They didn't even know the charge because in our electric convention, uh, electricity charge flows from positive to negative. So when you have a current diagram, if you ever engage in one, it'll show the direction of flow of current going from positive to negative. That's because people didn't know that electricity in wires is carried by a thing called the electron, which happens to have a negative charge. So the real direction of the electrons is always in the opposite direction of the quote unquote current, because it's just the convention. So the electron is not discovered, and again, terrible at numbers, uh, uh, left out. I believe it's 95, 1895 is uh, Thompson discovers the electron. And that really is as revolutionary a change as the Maxwell equations. So during this period, we're still in what you might call the Eden period uh, of a pure field understanding of electromagnetism. One thing we'll get into in the next session is since people did know that atoms existed, atoms being some sort of particle, uh, Maxwell tried to describe the existence of atoms in terms of a field theory. And that's quite important and we'll get, I'll be sending you readings on that. But what was discovered at the end of the 19th century with several things pretty much simultaneously in the 90s. First of all, the discovery of the electron, so that there was this extremely tiny particle, much smaller than an atom in mass, that carried electricity. Second of all was the discovery of what you mentioned, radioactivity, that certain, not all materials, emitted rays that people weren't sure what they were. They eventually discovered that they were a combination of extremely energetic electromagnetic radiation, gamma rays, and additional particles, beta particles, which turned out to be our same electrons, just with a different name, and alpha particles, which turned out to be the nuclei of helium atoms. So all of this we're going to get to. I'll answer your question very briefly, though, is it wasn't until, A, the discovery of radioactivity, and then B, in the 20th century, the discovery of uh, strong nuclear reactions, which was two types, fission reactions, which were reactions that involved, that were set off by a neutron. And we'll get to that, neutron being a neutral, electrically neutral particle. They didn't know even existed in the 19th century. And the reactions I deal with, fusion reactions, in which nuclei and high energy interact with each other. So radioactive waste, is the highly radioactive material that is produced from fission reactions. It is possible, theoretically, whether it's technically possible and commercially possible, we don't know yet, but theoretically it is possible to dispose of nuclear waste with fusion reactions which is 
you can use fusion reactions to produce re nuclear reactions that convert radioactive material into non-radioactive material. So you, these reactions go both ways. You can convert non-radioactive material to radioactive material, which is called induced radioactivity, which is, for example, what happens in a nuclear energy, a fission plant, the steel in the plant, the concrete in the plant does not participate in the production of the energy. That's only the uranium in the plant. But the neutrons emitted convert some of that material into radioactive uh, elements. And then you have to deal with induced radioactivity in, in the entire structure. One of the great things about the fusion energy technology that we're working on at LPP Fusion is that it doesn't produce any radioactive waste at all because the fusion reaction, different than the fission reaction, doesn't involve neutrons. And it's the neutrons that produce the radioactive waste. So as I say, we'll get into that as we go forward. I just want to, well, let me ask for further questions and then I'll go on to one last topic. Okay. I wanna emphasize, and this really wasn't in the readings, that the reaction, the interaction of science, technology, and the greater society is not just in one direction. It's in both directions. Not only does science, through technology advances, have radical impact on society, obviously, we have a very different society based on the electrical technology that was developed in the last part of the 20th, uh, the 19th century than before. I mean, if you look back in literature, all of your Victorian era literature, Sherlock Holmes, uh, Jane Austen, who some other currently popular 19th century uh, novelists, we're in the society of, you know, horses, steam, steam engines, and so on. By the end of the, the 19th century, in the most developed sections, you're moving into a to totally different and much more to us familiar society. Electric lights, telephones, phonographs, movies, all of this technology, electric, uh, you know, factories driven by electric motors, um, all of this on the development of the impact of technology. But it goes in the opposite direction. The ideas and the development of those ideas are influenced by what's happening in society. When society is changing very slowly, when the social structure of society is very rigid, when the economy is changing very slowly, it's very difficult for scientists to develop fundamentally new ideas because scientists are part of society. And what makes sense to people is the ideas scientists can come up with. Scientists aren't outside of society. So the period that we're dealing with here was a period of rapid social change. So we're dealing with the period from approximately 1850, which is when Faraday formulated his theories of the magnetic field, to 1875, when Maxwell had published his theory in its fullest form. I don't know whether people are familiar with European American history, but 1850 to 1875, can we think of 
some big events that occurred during that period anywhere in the world, US or otherwise. I mean, like the Civil War? Right. Civil War, you have in what had become one of the important parts of the world economy, the source of most cotton, you have the abolition of slavery. So that has a gigantic impact on the wage structure, not only in the United States, but even in, in Europe, you start to have, when free labor is no longer competing with enforced labor, with coerced labor, you start to have the first successful formation of trade unions, uh, strikes, and another similar big event of the, of the, the time, There was the unification of Germany under Prussia and uh, also just uh, erosion of feudalism throughout Europe. Right. Erosion of feudalism in a country in the headlines today, big hint. That would be uh, Russia. Right. What happened in Russia? Um, in that period? Yeah. Uh, well, I know okay. there were some people dropping bombs on the czar, but Euro uh, European, <laughs> yeah, well, European history is not taught in the United States. Mm -hmm. The czar, to explicitly, and he said this to prevent serfdom from being abolished from below, he abolished serfdom from above. Okay, so in. Um, in uh, the same period as the Civil War, from 1861 to 1866, the emperor, uh, the Tsar of Russia, passed a number of decrees which liberated the serfs and in a fairly reactionary and limited way gave quite a few of them uh, land. This reform was later extended by peasant protests and so on. A lot of the issues of the reform were still there at the time of the Russian Revolution, which is why one of the slogans was land to the peasants. But it was a big change because the serfs really were enslaved to the landlords. And they, they did not have any sort of personal freedom. So this again started to liberate uh, as you say, the changes in Europe, a lot of the, the feudal restrictions left over from the 18th century started to liberate a uh, process of advances in industrial production, industrial employment, and in the trade union movement, the socialist movement, which led to very rapid rises in the standard of living. And I wanted to show people, um, I thought this was pretty dramatic. This is life expectancy in the United Kingdom. And you see that despite uh, the advances of science in the period of the uh, Industrial Revolution, the life expectancy in the United Kingdom, the most industrialized country at the time, in 1865, 42 years is barely more than it was at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in 1765. But after this period, as we enter this period I'm speaking of, you have uh, a very rapid rise in the life expectancy so that in the subsequent you know, century, you have a rise from 40 years to 70 years, very rapid rise throughout the 
the last years of the 19th century. Uh, the dip you see, of course, is the famous uh, is the combination of World War I and the famous 1918 flu. And there will be another dip here for COVID. But overall, a very rapid rise through the 1950s. So this is an, exa an example of both the rapid development of society that was giving rise to the idea that revolutionary, rapid revolutionary change was possible, which encouraged the development of revolutionary ideas in science. And it was the effect of scientific discoveries that could give rise to uh, great increases in productivity. And finally, it was increasing wages that gave capitalists massive incentive for encouraging and paying for research and development to increase productivity. When during this whole period when wages are very stagnant and very low, reflected in the extremely low standard of living, there was much less incentive for the rapid application of technology. But as wages start to rise, uh, as the trade union movement develops, and in Europe, the socialist movement, there's much more incentive for replacing human labor with machinery and especially with electric machinery. So, um, right. So we're getting pretty much near the end. So let me, um, yeah, ask for additional comments or questions and then we'll wind up. Anyone? Okay. So let me just look at the calendar in terms of next time because I'm not, I don't think three weeks is going to work. Yeah.